Why do we all want more money? There are two major reasons. Either we want to have a higher standard of living or secondly, we want to have more security. We want to have more freedom in how we use our time. Now let's have a look at the second part. How much money do we actually need in order to be financially free? And what kind of returns do we actually need to make long term in order to make that happen? So let's say we go with comparatively high risk investments. So with tech stocks and with Bitcoin. Let's first see how much those assets actually long term return. So what we've got over here is the Nasdaq 100 divided by US money supply. So that's USM2. So I'm not taking the official inflation rates. I'm taking US money supply, which is growing, by the way, by roughly 6.8% per annum. But the Nasdaq 100 outperformed that money supply expansion by roughly 1560% over the span of 40 years. So that's a 16.6x again over the course of 40 years. That equates to a real performance of 7.3% per annum. So this is how much we gain, relatively speaking, by buying the Nasdaq 100 over the very, very long term. Of course, there are some crashes in here. This is the global financial crisis and this is the dot-com bubble, but we're taking all of that into account. Now, how about Bitcoin? What we see over here is the Bitcoin price divided by the Nasdaq 100. So how much does Bitcoin outperform the Nasdaq 100? The answer is since December of 2017, when Bitcoin was at 20K, it sometimes crashed, it then recovered, etc. But it actually did not outperform the Nasdaq 100. So Bitcoin roughly 3x since the end of 2017 and the Nasdaq also roughly 3x since then. So let's work with a bearish assumption, right? We want to be as cautious as possible. Let's say we own some tech stocks. Let's say we own some Bitcoin and let's say that both of them outperform monetary expansion by roughly 7.2% per annum. So we equate the expected returns of technology stocks and Bitcoin, which I believe is a very cautious assumption. So in order to be financially free, we need to cover all of our annual expenses with that real return of 7.276%. So we can simply calculate the inverse of that. So one divided by those 7%, we get a factor of 13.7. In other words, if you've got 13.7 times your annual expenses saved up and you've got that in Bitcoin and in tech stocks, you should be good, right? You should be able to retire and not have to work a day in your life again. Of course, there's risk with everything, right? We don't know if those returns will last forever, but we have to work with some assumptions and I believe we are rather cautious, at least with the Bitcoin returns. Now, how can we achieve this? How can we get to 13.7 times the expenses? Let's work with post-tax income and let's make it simple. Let's say our annual income is 100K. And again, that's after taxes. Let's run a few simulations over different periods of time. So let's say the maximum is 30 years. We want to be retiring at least after saving and investing for 30 years. And let's work with different savings rates. Let's start off with 20% savings rate. So after one year, we've got 20K saved up. Now that money is going to compound. Again, we are just looking at real numbers here. We forget about the normal numbers. We just look at real numbers. So everything is after inflation or after monetary expansion. We will have in real purchasing power, $21,455 due to the investment in the Nasdaq 100 and in Bitcoin after a year. And again, after that year, we have of course saved another 20% of our annual income. Now what I'm assuming here, and this is also a rather pessimistic assumption, what I'm assuming is that our income in real terms will not go up. It's actually not that easy to beat monetary expansion with regular drop incomes because again, monetary expansion is 6.8%. So if you just stay at your job, you're probably just getting the official inflation number adjustment, but probably a lot of other things get more expensive much faster, right? Like for example, medical expenses, educational expenses, etc. But let's work with that. Let's say we increase our income by 6.8% because we sometimes job hop, because we sometimes progress in our career and so after a year we've got 41,455 so that's our real money let's convert this into years of expenses now the 20% is our savings rate that in turn means that our expenses are 80% so one minus the 20% or in other words in real money 
$80,000. So we're simply dividing what we currently have in net worth by those annual expenses and we've got our years. And so we can simply extrapolate that out. Let's see at what we arrive. We get to the 13.7 year mark after 23 years of doing this, right? After 23 years of saving 20%, expending 80% and putting this into high risk investments. And so now there are several ways to get faster to that number. We could try to increase the return, but that's not that easy because we're already taking very high risk investments and we put all our money in that the most straightforward way is to increase the savings rate so let's put the 20 percent over here as a reference point when we now save 30 percent and we only spend 70 percent we've got two effects first of all we are saving 50 percent more relatively speaking right we're jumping from 20 to 30 secondly our expenses also go down so our saved up money relative to our expenses increases as well so adjusting the savings rate makes a quite large impact. Have a look at this, right? When we save 30% per annum instead of 20 after taxes, we can retire already after 17 years instead of 23 years. Let's say we get even more aggressive. We save 40%. Now we retire after 13 years. Let's say we save half of our income every year. We put this all in high risk investments. After 10 years, we are done with everything. This video is sponsored by the premium membership. I never take any money from any crypto project. I never take any affiliate links from centralized exchanges. I never pump and dump coins. Instead, I offer valuable tutorials in the premium membership. Feel free to check it out. Now, how on earth is it possible to save half of the income? Again, there are several levers here, right? The first lever is to simply try to earn way, way more to figure out a career that makes a lot of money that's potentially scalable. The second way, and that might be easier depending on what your actual job is, you might be able to make your money in a high income country and you might be able to spend that in a low income country. So you're using geographic arbitrage. You make money, say, in the US and you spend this then, say, in Thailand. That's, by the way, one of the reasons why I'm most of the time in Malaysia, because the price level in Malaysia is very, very low. It's roughly one third of what you have in the US. And so saving 50 percent of your income isn't really that hard. Now, what's important to note is that we work with zero lifestyle inflation here, right? Very likely over time, expenses might increase as well. And that's because you might have a family, you might get kids, you might have to pay for private education for those kids. You might need a bigger house, you might need a maid, whatever it is, right? All of those things increase expenses. That being said though, right? Once the kids are out of the house, all of those expenses also drop. And we are now working with a 50% savings rate. We can also work the the other way around as in you can keep a low savings rate say only 20 percent but once you've reached as in we can keep a low savings rate let's say 20 percent and you make and spend your money in the same country what you can then do once you want to retire is to then move to a cheaper country where maybe your expenses get cut in half. And so maybe you only need seven years of expenses, relatively speaking. So you could retire within 16 years. So that could be one potential plan, right? Let's say your child is two or three years old and will leave the house once it's 19. And you start this whole savings journey in your current country with 20%. You put this into QQQ, so the NASDAQ 100 ETF and into Bitcoin. And after 16 years, you've got those seven years. Once the child is out of the house, you're moving to Thailand or to the Philippines or to Malaysia. Your expenses drop by 50% and you're actually already over here and all of your expenses are covered by your 7% real return. There are of course some assumptions here and not every one of those assumptions are bulletproof, but I think it's very good to think about this fundamentally, right? It's good to potentially also run the numbers yourself. Think about how much can you save realistically? Think about how much this potentially lengthens or shortens your work period. Think about where you can potentially move once you retire. Think about the expense development with relating to your life plans, with relating to your family. 
This is simply just an introduction to get a grip, to get a feeling of what's realistic and what's not realistic. And it shows when you're hyper aggressive, when you do this geographic arbitrage from the beginning and you can actually make your money in a high income country, spend it in a low income country, you get a 50% savings rate that it actually only takes 10 years of work until you're 100% retired. But again, consider your lifestyle expenses, right? Consider that if you're still planning to add more members to the family, that this could add another one or two years to your working journey. Feel free to run the numbers yourself. Feel free to also comment down below. What's your savings rate? When are you planning to retire? I would be very interested what most people are actually planning with. If you've actually ever done this kind of exercise, feel free to, of course, also give this a like and subscribe in case it's your very first time here. I publish videos like this regularly on this channel. One more thing, in case you've got Telegram, feel free to join us. The link is down below. Looking very much forward to chatting with you.